Welcome to Morning Manna. I'm Pastor James, executive pastor here at Manna Church, and I'm thrilled to be with you this week as we look closely at the Great Commission. And if you're not familiar with the term Great Commission, you're not alone. In a Barner study, 51% of church churchgirders said they were unfamiliar with this term, and only 17% of respondents said they knew what the term and the scripture associated with it were. So even though 17% of churchgoers know the Great Commission, it doesn't mean all of them are obediently following it. Given that this was Jesus' final command before leaving this earthly realm, his famous last words, in essence, are recorded in Matthew. It's crucial that his followers today heed them, the task laid before them. The Great Commission is found as the final verses of the Gospel of Matthew. So turn with me as we read Matthew, and I'll begin at verse 16 for now. And now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus said, came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. I think there may be no better way to summarize the theology of Matthew than by following up on the themes found in the Great Commission. See, the book of Matthew has two focuses or, or themes. The first is the identity of Jesus. From the very beginning of Matthew, Matthew recalls the lineage of the genealogy of Jesus, and throughout this gospel, Matthew explains who Jesus was and is, the long-awaited Messiah, the new Abraham, the new Moses, and of course, Emmanuel. And I should note that this is not just for the Jews, but also for the Gentiles. You know, the book of Luke is commonly recognized as the gospel that incorporates the Gentile believers, and yet that theme is also prominent in Matthew's gospel. Now, the second focus of Matthew is to serve as a manual for discipleship. The setting of the commission finds the restored disciples worshiping Jesus, but not necessarily wholeheartedly. Throughout his gospel, Matthew has presented the weakness of the disciples, but even still, Jesus promises, Jesus promised to build his church on their foundational ministries. So here's the key for them and for us. God's power can overcome our infirmities. The Great Commission was not just meant for the original disciples. In Acts, we see that the persecution caused the church in Jerusalem to scatter, and those who have been scattered preached the word wherever they went. And you can read more about that in Acts chapter 8, verse 4. They, that early church modeled that as new believers were discipled, they in turn preached the gospel and discipled others. And this is because all believers are called to be ambassadors for Christ and to be ready to give an answer to any, everyone who asks to give the reason for the hope that you have. This means every obedient follower of Jesus is called to participate in his great commission. However, not every disciple of Christ is called to be a missionary. To say that the only way to be part of the great commission is by traveling overseas is a narrow view of the task. For even Paul, a great missionary for the Lord, did not ask the Roman church to join him in his travels. Rather, he asked his fellow believers to assist him on his journey and to join him in prayer. All right, come back tomorrow as we expand a little bit more on these thoughts and we examine the portions of scripture known as the Great Commission.